as we're joining, if you want to uh, join a little Zoom icebreaker, um, feel free to put um, your name and if you'd like to your pronouns in the comp in the uh, chat. If you um, are here um, with organizations, community organizations that you'd like to mention, feel free to include that as well. And um, here's our icebreaker question. Would you rather go into outer space or explore the ocean? I have to pick just one. So let us know which you'd rather do. And feel free to introduce yourself as we get ready to get going here. Groups <laughs> coming in. Haha, uh -huh. too lonely in space. I guess you might have Elon Musk to hang out with, but otherwise I agree. <laughs> or occasionally some other millionaire, billionaire, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I think it uh, looks like it's a strong night for ocean in this icebreaker. <laughs> Not a good night for the space enthusiasts. <laughs> oh, I'll repost the question for our icebreaker. Hang on. Would you rather go to space or explore the ocean? Also, if people would like to, um, not, not require, but if you wanted to put uh, your, um, name and pronouns in the chat. If you'd like to do that, you're welcome to. And also if you um, are um, affiliated with a group that you want to shout out in the chat, feel free to go ahead and do that as well. And I see us, yep, I think we're checking the time and seeing that we're starting to really fill up here. We have a lot of interest in this event. We're excited to get things started. I think um, it's time for us to get going here. So feel free to continue breaking the ice in the chat if you'd like. But meanwhile, I just want to welcome everyone to the Montgomery County Climate Visioning Summit, which is co-hosted by 350 MoCo and by Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Uh, before we begin, just a few quick tech reminders. Um, first of all, please do mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, and by now, we're all pretty experienced Zoomologists. But if you are um, not totally set on how to do that, you can look for the microphone icon, the bottom left side of your Zoom menu, and you can mute yourself right there. Um, that's going to help us keep the conversation flowing and clear as we do our event. Um, second uh, tech announcement is we are recording this event. Um, if you do not want to be included in the video, um, you please do turn off your camera. Your camera button is the one that says stop video right next to the mute button. So that's something that we can all do if you don't want your image on screen. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to get into our packed agenda. We have a lot to do tonight. So um, you can see the overview of the agenda already up on the screen share. First, we're going to start off with two amazing speakers that are going to kind of start to focus us on why we're here and what we need to get done um, for this Energy Foundation planning process. Um, our first speaker will be our delegate from District 20, Laura Charcoudian. She'll be discussing what's on the horizon for state level climate policy going into the next legislative session and why it's so important to be involved in these policy conversations. Uh, Laura will take a few questions um, afterwards while we have time. So um, while she's speaking, if you have a question, put in the chat and we will read those out and answer those as best we can while we have time. After Laura, I'm excited to introduce uh, Hashim Khan. He is a Montgomery County climate activist and works with the um, Montgomery County Green New Deal Coalition internship program. He's going to talk a little bit about his personal experiences working as a climate activist in the county and what 
he sees going on in the community. Uh, and then after our speakers, I'll be kicking it over to my um, co-host, Emily Frias from CCAN, who will talk about our project to develop a bold climate platform for the 2022 legislative session. And then we'll talk about the focus groups where we're really gonna spend most of our time. We are, we um, got a lot of folks votes and interest in focus groups. And as a result, we've set up um, three focus groups, although we're excited to report there's been so much interest in uh, one of them that we are going to do two sections of the uh, group A, renewables and buildings, less fossil fuel. Um, and those groups, in those groups, which will have, we have fantastic, highly qualified expert facilitators. They will be guiding us through a discussion about what we're seeing in our communities on climate, renewable energy, and how we can build the climate here in Maryland. And don't worry if you haven't, aren't sure what group you want to be in yet, um, you will have an opportunity to self-select the group um, as we prepare for the breakout. So you'll be able to pick the one that really speaks to you and to what you want to get in on right away. Um, and with that, I would like to take an opportunity to move on to introduce District 20 Delegate, Laura Charkudian. Great. Well, thank you. Um, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you all so much for taking the time to come. And I'm scanning the names as, uh, as I'm looking at folks coming in. And we have uh, a bunch of really extraordinary activists here. And I'm so grateful for all the work you've done over um, decades in some cases and more recently and all the work that you're still committed to doing. And so um, I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation among many. Um, so I'm talking a little bit today about why state level policymaking is so important. I think, uh, again, when I'm scanning who's here, I know that many of you have spent a lot of time and effort in both county and state and federal level policymaking. So um, you know a lot of this already, but I'm just going to quickly talk about really historically in this country, as we know, up until this point, uh, it all, almost all of the really significant climate work has been done at the state level. And what we see even now as we look at what's happening at the federal level, um, and we need to keep fighting at the federal level, I'll come back to that in just a moment, but when we see what's happening at the federal level, really so much of what's being done at the federal level has been influenced by the successful state level policy making that's been done over the years. And so the things that we've done effectively and the places where we've figured out where we can have success where we can do climate justice with equity, where we can build good climate jobs that are union jobs as well, where we can move the needle on clean energy, where the investments really make sense. When we look at all of those things we've done at the state level, I say we both here in Maryland, but across the country, um, the best practices out of that is what's influencing the federal conversation. And so, um, so that's a really important thing to keep in mind because while we hope and we need to keep fighting right now for this massive infusion of federal uh, cash into a good future climate, clean energy future. Um, we also need to keep the states at this sort of cutting edge place because in a few years, we'll want to be back at that federal level, pushing the needle even further. And so it's really important that, um, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. It's really important that all of us are continuing to push at the federal level. I know many of you are, and that we're keeping our eye on, on the work at the state level. And even, you know, we're not really talking so much about the county level, but then if you drill down a little bit further, what we do at the state level is also then influenced by what we do at the county level. And so in Montgomery County, you know, we've had this opportunity to sort of be on the cutting edge and, and um, you know, with, with plastic bag, with waste, with um, clean energy, with all of these things that then have the ability to influence um, what we do at the state level. So um, strongly encourage folks to sort of keep our eye on, on all of those, those tiers. Uh, we absolutely need, and federal of course is very, very important because they have the ability to print money and we don't and we need that money. Um, but then the next reason that the state level decision making is so important is because how we spend that money, even when the money comes into the state for clean energy, how we make those investments in the state can determine which kinds of clean energy, what definitions we're using 
for clean energy um, and how clean that clean energy is, but also how equitable that clean energy is. So that money comes in and hopefully some of the money that comes from the federal government is going to come with strings attached for equity, is going to come with strings attached for good jobs, but probably not enough. And so we're really going to have to do the work at the state level to put in um, the context and the structures and the ways and the priorities we're going to make those investments so that we take whatever federal money we could possibly get our hands on and invest it in real clean energy, but in clean energy that builds the good jobs and in clean energy that's grounded in equity and grounded in our ability to transform our economy completely into one that is clean and just. And so um, with that in mind, I'm going to highlight a couple of things that we're going to want to be keeping an eye on in the upcoming legislative session. Um, of course, we have um, you made some great success, as, so we made some great strides on the transportation end of things. We made some good strides last year um, with the, the Transit Safety Act, and we need to override that veto, and I believe we will. It'll be front and center probably in a special session um, that we'll have this December that'll focus primarily on redistricting, but we'll also do all the veto overrides at that time. Um, we'll also, uh, you know, continuing in the, in the, in the, there's additional sort of transit work that we need to continue to focus on. Really, that bill was kind of catching up to where we should have been, you know, last year. Um, so really moving forward with transit is going to be important. Moving forward with electric vehicles specifically, something I've started to explore is how do we get the EV sort of transformation in a way that in, ensures equity, ensures the uptick in EVs includes a lot of our lower income communities. And then of course, EVs in terms of school buses and um, the, the places where, where you know, children especially are breathing the fumes, but also the places where the fumes of any sort of transportation is affecting um, a community's uh, air quality. Um, so then, of course, we have, uh, as folks know, the Climate Solutions Now Act did not pass at the end of last year. So a couple of key things in there. One is um, it is speeding up our greenhouse gas reduction emissions goals. Um, and then another really significant piece of that bill that didn't kind of make it into another bill um, before the end of last session is the building standards and the building codes. And so really, we have this opportunity. It probably won't look exactly like that, but we have this opportunity this year to really um, do some, some good work around buildings um, and specifically on electrification of buildings, beneficial electrification across the board, all electric new construction. Um, they're going to be really intense um, fights around those issues, but that's a really key piece going forward. And then I think we're also going to see um, in, the, in the energy world, we're going to see um, some work that we can do on distributed energy. Um, there's going to be some focus. I'm, I'm looking and working with some of you on looking at our distribution grid. What is it we need to do within our distribution grid? The Public Service Commission is looking at this issue. What do we need to do within our distribution grid um, to make sure that the grid itself is designed to maximize um, to, 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 to maximize decarbonization, distributed energy resources, um, uh, microgrids, resilience, um, and there's a lot that can be done in how we plan that can maximize the clean energy, especially distributed energy, solar and storage on the, on the grid. Um, and then of course, um, the equity within energy efficiency. So I'm just gonna plug my one particular bill of mine, which is um, low income energy efficiency. And I'm hoping that a combination of, of sort of the pressure from the last three years and some federal money that'll be coming this way will really give us a chance this year to invest heavily in energy efficiency in, in low-income housing. So that's a quick overview. There'll probably be there'll be some things to keep an eye on, certainly in terms of um, in terms also of, uh, of resilience and adaptation. There'll be some things to keep an eye on in terms of agriculture and um, and and some other areas. But those are those are some highlights uh, I wanted to mention. And I think that um, there's I don't know a minute left or five minutes. I'm not sure uh, for for questions. But I'll go ahead and take whatever it is the facilitators want to offer to me. Thank you so much, Delegate Charcuti, and um, thank you for those comments for helping us out with this. Any questions for Delegate Charcuti, and please do pop them in the chat. And um, as long as she has time for us, we are are uh, here for it. Hmm. The first one, how, how do you, what do you feel about the highway widening plans for the Beltway and 270? Uh, what's the status of that and what can we do in the next session to stop it? 
Yeah. So um, I think folks probably know that sort of we've we've had success with roughly half of that project. So the highway widening on the Beltway, sort of uh, east of the east of 270, is off the table for all intents and purposes. Um, so that's good, and I think that came about because of the incredible activist activism, because of the pushback from elected officials, from state and county elected officials, and so on. So we still on the table is uh, the. Um, the project uh, American Legion Bridge up to 70 um, widening and, and really the, you know, Hogan is excited about the opportunity to put money in the pockets of his friends at Transurban and, and other highway widening companies. And so, um, you know, despite the fact that that doesn't make sense from so many perspectives and despite the pushback that that's come in for that, um, he's really trying to plow forward with that. I actually think, um, you know, what we've done legislatively is we've passed multiple bills that sort of check that effort um, uh, in, in the house. So multiple bills that are about, um, requiring local consent, multiple bills that are about requiring more transparency in public private partnerships. You know, we're watching the purple line, which I'm a huge supporter of the purple line, but the purple line public private partnership is a disaster. And we're watching that sort of like fall apart and struggling to keep, keep that train on the tracks, if you will. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, you know, you have the governor who wants to run a, a public private partnership that's like 10 times as, as, as large as that. So we've tried to put into, we have passed in the house, um, lots of bills that are related to sort of checking in a number of ways, delaying. Um, and unfortunately, none of those have passed the Senate. And so we just don't really seem to have the um, traction in the Senate, the votes in the Senate, political power in the Senate to stop the project legislatively. Um, so definitely keep talking to your senators and engaging with your senators on that. I am briefly, cautiously optimistic that because there is, um, you know, a, about a year and a, a change left on the governor's um, tenure, that if we get the right governor into office, um, we can delay the project for long enough and there'll be lawsuits and other things and we'll have a new governor in there and we'll be able to um, to get ourselves out of it. There might be a cost to the state, um, but um, but we'll, we'll be able to pull ourselves out of it. Thank you so much to, let's see, I'm checking with my co-host here. Do you think we have time for, for one more question perhaps? Um, oh, let's just take one more. One more quick, um, let's see, so the next, uh, in line, oh, this, could you talk about why the Climate Solutions Now Act didn't pass and how we can do to pass it this time around? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, there's funny things that happen in Annapolis that um, sometimes is hard for folks, well, even those of us on the inside to exactly know what's going on, and it's very sort of committee specific, and, and this year I think it was even harder to tell exactly what was going on because we weren't even all in the same room, we weren't even in the same room when we were voting, we were, as folks may have, may have, have known, we were sort of spread across on the uh, two different floors essentially to be voting on. Um, and we certainly didn't get to have a lot of the interaction with um, both community members, activists, lobbyists, and senators that we normally have that gives us a chance to sort of sort out like, what are your actual concerns about this bill? So I think that the, the lack of sort of that normalcy and the ability, not that there wasn't any communication, clearly there was communication between the House and the Senate and, um, and there wasn't agreement on the final decisions about that bill. But I think the lack of those sort of informal spaces where we get a chance to, to engage and communicate and work through work through those kinds of disagreements, I think that that was a real disadvantage as it related to this, this bill. The other thing that I would say is that this year, because we had, um, again, in an unusual year logistically, uh, we also had a lot of things that were uh, were a top priority for leadership, including things like police reform, which were really crucial to pass this year as well. And so, um, so because there was somewhat of a limited space and time for the negotiations, and um, and other other priorities uh, that that we're going to get through, um, this one sort of just didn't quite make it by the end of session. And I think that that's unfortunate. And obviously, we have to have. Um, you know, if, uh, the planet's on fire, and so we need to be moving these bills as 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 uh, with as much priority as possible. But I think that that ultimately the sort of disagreements between the House and the Senate, we just we we just couldn't sort of pull it off in the time that we had, and in the um, just in the the space and the way that that conversations and work was getting done. I am um, hopeful 
actually that we will pass something this year that will have a lot of elements of that. And we did end up, we ended up, people may or may not know, we ended up getting pieces, you know, like the tree planting, for example, you know, kind of sent them off on life rafts off of that bill and put them on other bills when it became clear that that bill wasn't going to make it through. So we, we got a couple of, of key components of that, but really the core of that, um, and especially the buildings work and the, the actual numbers around greenhouse gas reduction um, did not get through. And so we've got to do that this year. Thank you, Delegate Tricudian. Um, checking the time, I think we probably, let's see, I'm looking, uh, Emily, perhaps do you, you think that yeah. we have a little more, I probably should say thank I think, you. I think we should probably move on, but thank you so much, Delegate, for your great thank answers. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you really appreciate it. Um, and I, uh, at this point, happy to introduce our next speaker, who is Hashim Khan. Hashim is a senior at Watkins Mill High School. Um, and I know there's some folks here at this in this uh, meeting who were there and participated in this event, but Hashim was a leader of an extraordinary um, student-led climate justice protest that happened at the Executive Office Building and at um, Montgomery High School in August, um, at which, um, you can correct me if I get the number wrong, I believe five local, uh, youth climate activists risked arrest and were in fact arrested um, for demanding climate justice and action on climate priorities in the county. And um, Hashim um, was a leader in that um, protest and he is also an intern for the Montgomery County Green New Deal Internship Program. And he's here just to talk a little bit about those experiences and to talk about what he is and his fellow activists are seeing in the county. Thank you so much. Uh, real quick, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, Delegate, I'm honored to be speaking with you today. Um, so um, I can just go ahead and start off. This summer, um, we I participated in an internship program called the Montgomery County Green New Deal Internship. And under Jim, Jim Driscoll's uh, leadership, we discussed the many issues facing Montgomery County uh, currently. Now, climate change is the biggest one that we talked about. Was It was because this a problem encompasses the entire world, obviously. But um, as the influence that we hold in Montgomery County, it would have been wrong to not speak up, to not do something, to not take action, which is why I decided to lead the demonstration on August 26th. Now, um, from what we've learned, there are many disparities within MCPS. Um, Montgomery County Public Schools is, you know, lacking in a lot of things, but this is not their fault. This is, this is, you know, goes back to the county level. What we can do to implement change on a county basis directly affects us students. So we wanted to talk about multiple issues, climate change and climate related issues not only impact us, but will impact our generation greatly at a more intense rate than um, the previous generations. Obviously, we will outlive the previous generations and we will bear the brunt. We will face the consequences of climate change. Now, this being said, we have so many other issues to tackle with is, and the reason why Jim wanted to have um, a diverse group was to, to understand the issues that each group faces. So this uh, particular community um, views climate change to a different degree than, than, than the other. And this was an important aspect to encompass in this. The second thing of our, our main focus was to remove SROs from uh, Montgomery County high schools because a lot of the times, or most of the times, there was no de-escalation involved. Their job was to de-escalate situations. And more than half of the time, all they did was bridge, bridge the gap from the school to prison pipeline. And this is something that has to stop because it, it, it automatically impacts minority majority schools and minorities in particular. Um, so going back, going back to the internship, there was a lot to learn and there was a lot to do. We did um, many, many um, outreaches to several other organizations. There was Maryland's Poor People Campaign. There was uh, Faith in Vaccines. There was um, the Sunrise uh, for Green Energy and, and things like that. And throughout this entire this entire uh, eight week program, what I've learned is that outreach and organization and mobilization will only take you so far. You have to be on the front line demanding the action. What we went to Elrich's office, we protested that hot summer day to make sure he heard us. Elrich has a very sad history of neglecting his voters. Uh, we voted you into office. I want you to do your job is what we what what our message was that day. Um, to speak upon the people that were arrested, the the uh, 
the, the, the youth that got arrested that day, one of them is actually in the call. Shout out to Rocky. <laughs> so um, they, they volunteered to get arrested that day to show that they're definitely serious about this. This is not a another another movement just to hold posters and hold signs and call it a day after, after, after a few hours. No, we wanted to make sure that our voices were heard. And that's, that's, um, that's something that, that I really thought was achieved through this program. I do want to add that the program was extended. The internship has been extended to this fall. And we are planning another um another uh demonstration sometime later this this um this fall so i would say november sometime um also like just to wrap things up i know we're limited on time but uh just to wrap things up i did want to say that if we are to implement change if we are to you know demand justice we have to do it without any, you know, without anything holding us back, that we go on the front line, that we tell our senators, we tell our governors, we really get out to them and say, this is what we want. And if you don't give it to us, we'll vote someone in who will. Um, Delegate, I did like your point about, you know, if there is no, if there's, if uh, no governor can do it, then that is, this is what a democracy is for. We will vote that governor in. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that, Jeff. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I hope that you guys can support us for our next demonstration and, and things moving forward. We do want to establish a Green New Deal chapter at each MCPS high school so that our voices are uniformed and organized and they cannot make a stop with, you know, without, uh, without us retaliating. Thank you. Thank you, Asham. Thank you. And, and thank you for your passion and your hard work. And um, Every time I feel, start to feel especially down about my future, I listen to some of these uh, young activists. They are not, they're not messing around. They're gonna get, they're, they're out there working really hard. Um, so thank you so much for all you're doing. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to my co-host, uh, Emily Frias of Chesapeake Climate Action Network, who will talk a little bit about um, Energy Foundation process and move us into our um, group discussions. Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you so much, Hasham, for your for your words and Delegate Sharkudi and before. Um, so many people on this call know me. If you don't, um, I'm Emily Frias. I'm the Maryland Grassroots Coordinator at Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Um, so I really, I know I don't have to say on this call that um, the IPCC report from this summer was really alarming. And um, as someone who I'm from the generation who saw an inconvenient truth as a child in school. Um, and now I'm an adult working in the climate movement. Um, and I have to say, I'm pretty disappointed um, at what our country's leadership has delivered on climate so far. Um, so we have, we have a really narrow window to dramatically reduce our emissions. Um, and we need to start implementing solutions that actually match the scale of the problem. Um, and we also need to make sure that as we implement these solutions, we're really doing right by the people that are what will be most impacted. So our youth, um, but also, our communities that have been left out of um, federal programs, state programs in the past. Um, and also we know that uh, the people who created this problem are um, not gonna be the ones to pay the most. It's, it's actually gonna be the opposite. So these are principles that I've seen reflected in the chat today um, and they're really important to carry with us um, as we do daily, um, as we work daily to advocate for action in our own communities. Um, and I'm really proud to say that these principles are a foundation of our current coalition work. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick moment to share some slides that um, uh, show our talk a little bit about our mission and values with the for our coalition. Give me one second. Um, so uh, we have partnered with a number of um, climate groups across the state. It's a really, really large coalition right now of climate groups across the state, both grass tops and our grassroots organizations like 350 MoCo um, to, to come together for a really bold vision um, for the 2022 session. Um, where this, the process is being facilitated by the Energy Foundation and um, we have come together and developed this vision um, for, for our work together. Um, so our goal is to co-create equitable climate policy with front and fence line communities, um, impacted in communities, industry experts, and labor um, and advocates as well. We want to combine rigorous policy analysis and broad community outreach to develop our policy platforms um, for this le next legislative session, which is what you're about to take part in. 
And also we want to build a diverse movement centering those most impacted to address the climate crisis. Um, so as a key part of this process, um, we're conducting a survey and several focus groups like the ones that you're going to um, be participating in today. So we really, really thank you for taking the time to join us um, and really look forward to everything that you have. So um, before we break out into our groups, I just wanna set a couple of important ground rules. Um, so number one, make sure to keep it respectful. Make sure to use correct pronouns if they're, if they're listed in some of these profile, especially if they're pronouns that you're maybe not familiar or comfortable with. I definitely encourage you to lean in and, and make sure to use the right pronouns um, so that people feel safe and comfortable participating in this group. Um, don't interrupt, respect the stack order that your facilitator might use, um, be cordial, et cetera. Um, we'd really like to ask you to speak as much from your own experience as possible. Um, you know, we want to we want to hear from you and your experience and just know that we are making a great effort to hear from lots of folks um, and to, to really get at the results we want. We want to make sure we hear we're hearing from your own experience. Um, there's also no right or wrong answers here. Uh, you know, I, I think on this call, we all kind of lean towards a certain perspective, um, but we really want to hear an open dialogue. And just so know, just know that um, if you don't know something, um, I, that's actually also really useful information for us to know is if you've never heard of, of something before, um, we, we also want to know that. So just no right or wrong answers. Don't be embarrassed if you don't know um, exactly what we're talking about. I'd also like you to step up and step back for time considerations. We're gonna be taking about two to three responses per question. Um, we also ran over a little bit of time. Uh, so we're going to, we're gonna come back a little later than um, we were initially planning. So hopefully that'll make up for it. Um, but if you feel like you have a lot to say, uh, please take our survey as well. Um, that will, that covers all the same issue areas as well as some more. So we really want you to, if you, if you don't feel like you got to say everything you wanted, um, in our upcoming sessions, please just um, take our survey as well. Um, and then finally, um, for our focus groups, if you could please limit chat conversation unless prompted, we will be using the chat to answer some of the questions. So we want to make sure that there isn't a lot of side conversation going on while we're trying to um, answer those questions. All righty. So. so our breakout rooms, um, we're going to open them now. Uh, so we'll have, um, as we mentioned before, two, uh, well, three groups focusing on renewable energy. Um, all of the renewable energy uh, groups will also discuss building electrification. Um, we'll have, uh, we had a lot of interest in discussing renewable energy and fossil fuels. Um, so if you are interested in that, join one of the two groups that focus on fossil fuels. If you're more interested in talking about building out renewable energy, join the renewables focus group. And then finally, we have a transportation group. Um, we also had a lot of interest in that. So you should see a prompt um, shortly with the rooms um, that you uh, can join. Um, and so go ahead and do that. And if you're having trouble joining a, a, a room, um, just hang tight and um, our tech person will sort you manually. Um, so it does return to plenary at 8.50. We're going to return to the plenary um, at 8.55. Definitely didn't ask you about all of the different um, areas that we're looking at. Um, so if you, you know, if you were in one of the renewable energy groups, you probably didn't get asked a lot of questions about transportation, but you probably have thoughts about it. Um, so we really want to hear from you. Um, our survey will be open through October 15th. Um, you can either, if you'd like, just go ahead and scan that QR code right now. Um, that'll open up uh, the uh, survey link in your phone. Um, additionally, you can go to the shortened link there that I have at the bottom. That's EFMD22 survey link. Um, we'll also put that in the chat. Um, and we will have a Spanish version of our survey available very soon. Um, if you're interested in getting a copy of that Spanish survey and would like to just dis help distribute it, um, please get in touch with me directly at emily at Um, You can also feel free to get in touch with me uh, directly if you want to stay more involved in this process. Maybe you had some really good ideas in your breakout room today 
um, and you really want to talk to somebody um, about um, about seeing that go further. Um, so if that is if that is the case for you, I'd also really love to hear from you. Um, so I'll go ahead and leave this up and we'll see. Um, great, we've got it in the um, chat. It looks like our bit.ly actually didn't work very well, <laughs> but we have the main link um, there. So we would love, love, love to hear from you. And can I, uh, can I just see a thumbs up um, from folks who feel like they got to, they got to have an interesting conversation tonight. Just put a thumbs up on the, on your camera, on your screen, in the reactions. I'm seeing a lot of that. Great. Had some really interesting conversations tonight. Let's not let this be the end of it. Please stay in touch with CCAN and 350 um, and stay involved on, on seeing these great ideas through. Okay, we will uh, send, we will also, anybody who RSVP'd will also send you the link that way as well for the survey. So don't, if you didn't get it, uh, don't worry, uh, we will send it to you. All right, everybody, with that, I'm gonna close this out. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night.